The Law of Self-Defense content you are about to enjoy is presented for general educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. If you are in need of legal advice, consult competent legal counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. Okay, folks, welcome, welcome to this impromptu, unplanned Law of Self-Defense show. We, uh, this is one of our Cases of the Week shows. We normally only do these for our members, but every once in a while we come across a case that's sufficiently interesting that I'd like to share it with the general public, meaning all of you. So this is an unusual bonus, open access content, Law of Self-Defense Case of the Week. It involves a case out of California. Just a just about two weeks ago yesterday, this appellate court decision was handed down, and it c- touches on a number, I think, of really interesting, uh, both self-defense law issues and more generally character evidence type issues that can play a big role in any self-defense case. After all, if you're claiming self-defense, your credibility, your character is going to play a huge part. If the jury has no reason to believe you, well, then your self-defense claim is not going to be worth much regardless of the other legal merits. So again, this is a bonus open access law self-defense cases of the week for today, August 12th, 2020. Normally available only to our members, but for this exceptional bonus content available to the general public. So I hope a lot of you who are not yet law self-defense members who are on Facebook or YouTube uh, will have an opportunity to enjoy this and get a feel for what we do. Now, this case is People v. Lovejoy out of the California Court of Appeal. Decision handed down July 28th, 2020, just a couple of weeks ago. As always, in the text version of this show, uh, which will be available as a replay blog post at the Law Self-Defense website, open access again. You don't need to be a member to access it. But at the text version of today's show, we will link to the full text of this court decision. That'll be up a couple hours after the live show ends takes a little bit of uh, post-production time. Sorry about the delay. But there you'll be able to click on that link and read the entire decision. And I certainly encourage you to do that. It's the best way to learn the law. Also, this case happens to be out of California, but don't lose interest if you're from another state. The legal principles discussed here are largely applicable to the other 49 states as well. If they're not at any particular point, I'll be sure to highlight that so you know that it's a uniquely California thing. But most of what we'll be talking about today is not uniquely California. It's generally applicable to the 50 states. So in short, there's a lot to learn from this case, even if you live in another state. Now, for those who may not be familiar, I guess I should introduce myself first. I'm attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you very much. At Law of Self-Defense, we do nothing but use a force law, both as an act of law practice and for educational purposes to help make the law-abiding armed American public as hard to convict as they are to kill. Now, we do these cases of the week show several times a week. Again, normally for our members, this time open access. But every time we do one, we do what's called, a, uh, in legal terminology, a brief. We distill the 30 or 40 pages of the appellate court decision down to its essential components to make it easy for us to learn the relevant legal lessons from the case. Uh, So certainly we won't be going over 40 pages of content here, maybe five or six. But as part of that briefing process, we break the case up into distinct segments. So we have the same format every Cases of the Week show. First, I'll provide a brief overview of the case so you know what to expect. We'll discuss the facts of the case. We'll discuss the law as it was applied at trial. We'll do the analysis as it was done by the appellate court. We'll share with you the appellate court's decision, the outcome in this case, and then my own additional comments at the end. Um, So first, the overview. Let's go ahead and start with that. Let's see if I can pull that up appropriately. There we go. The overview of the case. So this is fundamentally a murder for hire case, one in which... The hired murderer, sadly, um, formerly in the Marine Corps, uh, but the hired murderer um, argues at trial that his shooting of the victim was actually self-defense. The appellate decision in this case is very long and involves a wide variety of legal issues. And given our space and time constraints in these cases of the week shows, we can't possibly cover every legal issue in the case. So even more than usual, I encourage you to go to the text version of today's show at lawselfdefense.com slash blog 
click on the link to read the full text of the case. That's the best way to learn the law, folks. Any kind of law, but a particular use of force law, is to read the actual appellate court decisions that illustrate how the actual laws apply to actual people and actual use of force events. Now, the specific legal issue I'd like to cover in this Cases of the Week is how the defendant in this case opened the door for the prosecutor to introduce before the jury very damaging character evidence where that evidence would have been excluded from the courtroom and unseen by the jury if only the defendant had not opened that door by his own self-serving and misleading testimony in front of the jury. So that's the core of what we'll be discussing today. Before I jump into that, however, I do want to mention our sponsor, which is, if it will come up, let's see, which is CCW Safe. Now, CCW Safe is a provider of legal service memberships, what many people mistakenly call self-defense insurance, but they, in effect, promise to pay their members legal expenses if their members involved in a use of force event. And those expenses start big and get bigger fast, folks. Uh, for example, in an aggravated assault case, the most common case I work on, uh, where you might have been threatened, you displayed your gun, you didn't fire a shot, didn't hurt anybody, but now you find you're charged with aggravated assault. You're looking at a retainer to your lead counsel in the order of thirty to $50,000, folks. And that's not for the trial. That's for the pre-trial work. If it's a murder case, you've actually killed someone in self-defense, you're charged with manslaughter or murder, you can easily go through $100,000 or $200,000 pre-trial expense. Multiply that pre-trial expense for either case uh, for the trial itself. So if you don't have that kind of money stuffed in your mattress, just in case you have to shoot somebody, it can be useful to have a financial partner standing behind you to make sure you have the resources you need to fight the legal battle the way you want it fought as if your life depended on it because your life as you know it depends on it. And that's what CCW Safe offers to do. Now, there are several companies out there that offer similar services. I've looked at all of them, as you might imagine, and I found that CCW Safe is the best fit for me personally. I'm a member of CCW Safe. My wife, Emily, is a member of CCW Safe. Whether they're the best fit for you, of course, is something only you can decide, but I do encourage you to take a look at what they have to offer by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash CCW Safe. And if you do decide to become a member of CCW Safe at that URL, you can save 10% off your membership. Again, at that URL, lawselfdefense.com slash CCW Safe, save 10% with the discount code LOSD10. That's LOSD for Law of Self Defense and the number 10. All right, folks, with our sponsor message out of the way, let's take a look now at not the overview of the case, but the facts of the case. Pull that up. Okay, there's the facts. And let me pull the case back up. There's the case reference, People vs. Lovejoy. So fundamentally, this case involves an angry ex-wife whose, whose last name, ironically, although she hires someone to murder her husband, her last name is Lovejoy. I kid you not. But in any case, the angry ex-wife pays her love interest, the defendant in this case, to murder her ex-husband, who, of course, is the victim in this case. Amazingly, the sum paid for this murder was a mere $2,000, half up front, half after the killing. In any case, Lovejoy and the victim, uh, the ex-husband, they were married in 2007, had a son in 2012, and were having serious marital difficulties by 2014. In that year, 2014, Lovejoy obtained a temporary restra restraining order against the victim, effectively throwing him out of the marital home and denying him unsupervised access to his son because she falsely accused the victim of having sexually assaulted both her and their child son. These accusations were ultimately found by the court to be lies, and the victim was ultimately awarded 50% custody of their son. Meanwhile, the couple continued to proceed through a contentious divorce proceeding, finally settling in June 2016, and as part of that agreement, the marital settlement agreement, Lovejoy, the ex-wife, was to retain the family home but pay the victim $120,000 as his share of the equity and to pay that within 90 days of the divorce settlement. Well, apparently she did not want to pay that $120,000, and she realized, I won't have to pay it if he's dead. As it happens, the prior year, Lovejoy had met the defendant in this case, Weldon McDavid, who was a firearms instructor 
and formerly in the Marine Corps. Uh, of course, McDavid would be the defendant. Lovejoy and the defendant would ultimately begin a romantic relationship, but even prior to the romantic relationship, Lovejoy and the defendant were already forming a plan for the defendant to lure the victim, the ex-husband, to a secluded area and murder him. Again, Lovejoy agreed to pay the defendant $1,000 up front and a second $1,000 when the victim was killed. For some people, folks, life is indeed cheap. Now, the trial uh, in this case involved both Lovejoy and the defendant. They were both um, charged as co-conspirators, basically, in the murder. And it involved a lot of circumstantial evidence consistent with the prosecution's narrative that this was a murder for hire. For example, the defendant instructed Lovejoy to buy a burner phone to facilitate their communications. And sure enough, Lovejoy later purchased exactly such a phone at a local Best Buy. A few days before the killing of the victim was to take place, the defendant performed surveillance of the secluded area to which he intended to lure the victim. And afterwards, investigators would find the defendant's DNA at that location, the location of the intended killing. Now, on the day the killing was to take place, and by the way, they, they selected that day. Actually, it was night. They selected that night specifically because it was a night of a new moon. So it would be as dark as possible. But on the night of the killing, the defendant had Lovejoy drive him to the secluded area, told her he would call her on the burner phone when he needed to be picked up after killing the victim. Now, the defendant brought with him some items belonging to the victim's son, and he called the victim and told the victim he was a private investigator with important information about the son and said he would share that information with the victim, but only at this secluded location. After hanging up with the defendant, the suspicious victim, reasonably enough suspicious, the victim called the local police department, shared his conversation with the defendant, and they said, well, it seems odd, but they didn't seem to be very concerned. The victim was concerned, he was still suspicious, and he asked a male neighbor to accompany him to the secluded area. When they got there, the victim carried a flashlight to see in the near total darkness, and the neighbor carried a baseball bat, but neither one of them had a gun. When the victim and neighbor arrived at this secluded location, they became increasingly suspicious and they began to use the flashlight to scan the area. The victim spotted the defendant, who was only about 60 feet away, folks, not 60 yards, 60 feet away. The defendant was dressed in camouflage clothing and, most alarmingly, was pointing an AR-15 rifle at the victim. Naturally, the victim and neighbor turned to run away and the defendant began shooting at them, hitting the victim once in the back and continuing to fire as the two men fled back to their car. Now, once they got in the car, the victim realized for the first time he'd been hit. They pulled over. They called 911. Fortunately for the victim, he would survive the gunshot wound. So this is not a murder case. This is a conspiracy to commit murder and a premeditated attempted murder case. In any case, after the victim and his friend managed to flee, the defendant called Lovejoy on the burner phone and had her pick him up, telling her, well, I messed up. No kidding. Later, investigative officers would find a piece of rifle brass that would match the defendant's rifle at the scene. They would find the defendant's DNA at the scene. They also learned that the phone that had been used to call the victim, that burner phone, uh, and lure the victim to the secluded area had been purchased at a Best Buy, and they went to the Best Buy and got their surveillance video from the store, and they identified the ex-wife, Lovejoy, as the buyer of the burner phone. So obviously this connected the ex-wife to the shooter, because it was the shooter who called the victim to the scene using that burner phone. Of course, they got a warrant for the defendant's home. They found an AR-15 rifle hidden under foam and sleeping bags in the garage. It had a little net brass catcher attached to it. There were several pieces of brass in the brass catcher, including brass that matched the piece of brass they found at the scene. They also found a camouflage jacket with dirt and plant material on it. So Lovejoy and the defendant were collectively charged with conspiracy to commit murder and an additional count of premeditated attempted murder. Now, next we're going to talk about the law as it was argued at trial or presented at trial or applied at trial. But before we dive into that, I do want to share with you in addition our totally free infographic on the five elements of a claim of self-defense. Folks, if you don't know the five elements of self-defense, you simply don't know self-defense law, period. There we go. Whoops. Try that again. 
Here we go. So any claim of self-defense is made up of a maximum of five elements. It's not rocket science. It's not 500 elements or 50 elements. It's only up to five elements of self-defense. But these are the building blocks of any claim of self-defense or defense of others. If you don't understand these, you can't possibly understand use of force law. So to facilitate your ability to understand it, we provide this totally free, does not cost a penny, infographic, the five elements of self-defense law. We show you what those five elements are. We provide a brief description. Again, it's free, folks. You'd be crazy not to download it. It's just a free PDF download. You can get that at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. You can open up another tab in your browser right now. Download it, lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Our free gift from Law of Self-Defense to all of you. Don't be crazy. Get the infographic. It's free. Okay, folks, now let's get back to the actual case. Now we'll take a look at the law as it was argued at the trial. This is a bit extensive because it was kind of a complicated trial, but complicated, uh, not so complicated a narrative of, of uh, guilt as we've already described it, uh, but a rather complicated narrative of innocence presented by the defense. So at trial, the prosecution's narrative of guilt was one of murder for hire, as we just described. The defendant's defense was somewhat convoluted. Uh, he conceded that he shot the victim. I mean, it would be hard not to have to concede that. He conceded he shot the victim, but first he argued that he did so in self-defense when he perceived the victim was about to shoot him. And second, he tried to undermine the prosecution's claim that the he intended to kill the victim by saying that, well, I was trained as an expert marksman by the Marine Corps. I was only 60 feet away. I had a rifle. If I'd intended to kill the victim when I shot him, I'd have killed him. The victim would have been dead. So it's the second part of the defense. The defendants repeated an extensive references to his time and training in the Marine Corps as an expert rifleman that led directly to the primary issue in this case that I want to discuss with you today. And that is that this testimony opened the door. The defendant opened the door by his own testimony to very damaging character evidence that would otherwise have been excluded from the trial and never heard by the jury. And that damaging character evidence was that although it was true that the defendant had served in the Marine Corps and been an expert rifleman in the Marine Corps, it was also the fact that he'd ultimately been tossed from the Corps under less than honorable conditions. Uh, the reasons for this less than honorable discharge were numerous, but key among them was the additional damaging character evidence that the defendant, while serving, had been convicted of two misdemeanor counts of unlawfully carrying a concealed weapon. Now, normally, character evidence that's not directly related to the criminal charges in a case is excluded from that trial on those charges. Any defendant supposed to be judged by the evidence against him that's directly tied to the charges he's facing. He's not supposed to be judged based on some unrelated misconduct he might have engaged in at some prior date. So under normal circumstances, this defendant's less than honorable discharge from the Marine Corps and the two misdemeanor gun convictions would have been excluded from the jury's knowledge in this conspiracy to murder an attempted murder of the victim case. There are, however, circumstances in which normally excluded character evidence is instead admitted into evidence and heard by the jury. And one of the ways this can happen is if a defendant himself opens the door to such evidence. So what I mean by opens the door is, for example, say that a defendant had been convicted at some prior date of misdemeanor theft some years prior. This would be character evidence that would normally be inadmissible in a later, totally unrelated assault case. In that assault case, however, imagine that the defendant introduces evidence. Either he testifies or he introduces other witnesses who testify that he has a law-abiding character. Well, if the defendant claims in the assault trial that he is a law-abiding character, that opens the door to the prosecution to introduce that evidence of the earlier theft convictions to rebut the defendant's claim of being law-abiding. Had the defendant not claimed to be law-abiding in the assault trial, the theft convictions would have been inadmissible. But by making that claim of being law-abiding, the defendant opened the door to those theft convictions being admissible because they suggest that he's not, in fact, law-abiding. 
In this particular conspiracy to murder case, the defendant introduced considerable evidence of his time in the Marine Corps, and he did it for two purposes, one specific and one general. The specific purpose was to support his claim that, hey, had I intended to kill the victim, the victim would be dead because I, I was trained as an expert rifleman by the Marine Corps. And to this point, he introduced as witnesses uh, people who were actively serving in the Marines who testified as to his expert skill with a rifle. The second purpose, the general purpose for introducing evidence about his time in the Marine Corps was to have those same witnesses talk about his Marine Corps service in an effort to polish his character in front of the jury. So this trial was taking place not just anywhere in California, but in the San Diego, California area, proximate to the Marine Corps base of Camp Pendleton. Accordingly, there was a large Marine presence in the community, and the Marine Corps was generally... Uh, and Marines in particular, were held in high esteem within the community. So in advancing this purpose of showing what a good character he has, because he was a good Marine, uh, he says, uh, one defense witness in active duty, still active duty Marine named Kaiser, who had been the defendant's supervisor in the Marine Corps, Kaiser routinely, when he was testifying, referred to the defendant as Staff Sergeant Defendant and testified that the defendant was an expert shooter while in the Marine Corps. The defendant also took the stand and testified in his own behalf, focusing particularly on his expert rifle skills as trained in the Marine Corps as arguably undercutting the prosecution's claim that he'd intended to kill the victim. After all, expert shot, if he wanted the victim dead, the victim would be dead, was the defense argument. Now, once the defendant took the witness stand, he was, of course, subject to cross-examination, and the prosecution began to expose the fact that the defendant had been tossed out of the Marine Corps on the basis of a less-than-honorable discharge. Now, initially, rather than expose that normally inadmissible character evidence directly, the prosecution kind of attacked it from the flanks. So the prosecution asked the defendant, are you still entitled to wear a Marine uniform, which, after being released from the Marine under Marines under honorable conditions, uh, someone would normally be entitled to still wear their uniform, but a dishonorably Marine would not be. And to this question, the defendant responded, well, if I wanted to wear a Marine uniform, no one would stop me. Well, of course, that's lying by omission. He's actually not permitted to wear a Marine uniform, but of course, he didn't want to say that. The prosecution then asked if the defendant would be privileged to re-enlist in the Marines if he wanted to. Now, someone who's been honorably released from the Marines might have an option to re-enlist, I guess, depending on the needs of the Marine Corps. But certainly someone who's been less than honorably discharged is not going to be welcomed back. Uh, so this defendant would not be welcomed back. And his answer to this question about whether he was privileged to re-enlist, the defendant responded again in a misleading fashion saying, well, no, but I'm too old now. Well, being too old was not the reason. When pressed of age was the only reason the defendant would not be permitted to re-enlist, the defendant responded vaguely that, well, you know, the re-enlistment code would not permit me to re-enlist. At this point, the prosecution got tired of the defendant deflecting these questions, touching upon the reasons for his discharge, and asked directly, quote, you were forced out of the Marine Corps against your wishes, correct? And this time, the defendant finally responded, yes. Now, the prosecution would later also share with the jury the defendant's two prior convictions for misdemeanor unlawful concealed carry of a firearm, in part because those were the convictions that substantially contributed to the defendant's less than honorable separation from the Marine Corps. Now, when all this bad character evidence was exposed to the jury, the defense counsel objected, uh, arguing in essence that, well, this, Your Honor, this is inadmissible character evidence. And the judge had agreed pre-trial that this was inadmissible character evidence, but the judge had a caveat. Unless you, the defense, open up the door. And the prosecution in turn argued that they had done that. It was the defendant's continued references to his Marine Corps service as testament to his rifle skill and testament to his good character that opened the door to this normally inadmissible character evidence being admitted before the jury. And the trial court agreed with the prosecution, explaining it's the court's rationale in some detail, specifically that the court concluded that the defense had presented the Marine Corps evidence for precisely the reasons claimed by the prosecution and that the defendant had been less than honest in cross-examination and this conduct by the defense effectively opened the door to the admission of that bad character evidence. So the trial court allowed the evidence to stand 
of course, when the defense objected to this evidence, even though the jury was still allowed to consider it, it did preserve this issue for appeal. If the defense had not objected, the claimed error would not have been preserved for appeal. So the objection is important, even if the trial judge ends up overruling you because it does that preservation of the issue for appeal. Now, during the defendant's testimony in his own behalf, he'd also provided his own narrative of innocence to contest the conspiracy to murder and premeditated attempted murder charges against him. So this is the defense story to explain away what happened. First, the defendant conceded that he'd lured the victim to the secluded area, but said he did it not for the purpose of killing the victim, but in an effort to get the victim to implicate himself in child abuse. Specifically, the defendant said that he falsely told the victim he had evidence the victim had committed child abuse and that the victim could collect that evidence at this secluded area. And the defendant said, well, only someone actually guilty of child abuse would come to collect such evidence. A person innocent of child abuse would know the evidence didn't actually exist. And thus, if the victim showed up, that would be evidence of his guilt of child abuse. Second, the defendant testified that when the victim in fact showed up at the secluded area, the defendant had been previously informed by the ex-wife that the victim owned a gun. So the defendant had brought his own AR-15 with him for purposes of personal protection. And the defendant testified, hey, I only fired my rifle at the victim when I perceived the victim first pointing a gun at me. So my shooting at the victim was an act of self-defense. That was the defense narrative of innocence. Well, the jury didn't buy it. Ultimately, the jury declined to accept this narrative of innocence and instead found both the defendant and the ex-wife Lovejoy guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and premeditated murder. Now, next, we're going to jump into the analysis for this case, folks. But before I do, of course, I have something else to mention. At the start, I told all of you that normally our Cases of the Week shows are members-only content. This one is an exception. We're making it open access to the general public. But if you like this kind of content analysis, explanation, education, insight, well, you might just want to consider actually becoming a Law of Self-Defense member yourself. And the good news is it is really inexpensive to do that. In fact, uh, we offer a two-week trial membership for just 99 cents. And in the unlikely event you decide during those two weeks that it's not for you and you want your money back, we'll refund not just 100% of your money, but 200% of your money. That's a negative risk offer, folks. Really, it's hard to imagine why anyone wouldn't try out Law of Self-Defense membership for just 99 cents for two weeks. Now, after the two-week trial, full disclosure, membership does go up to full price, which is a mere 33 cents a day, folks, less than $10 a month. So if you don't feel the content we provide is worth 33 cents a day, you certainly should not become a member. But I would hope that most of you would agree that knowing these legal boundaries and legal principles are worth 33 cents a day, they make you that much harder to convict. And of course, as a member, you get our regular cases of the week, our regular after action analysis shows, and you get chat and commenting privileges at the Law of Self-Defense website. So you can continue to participate and learn past the end of any one of our live shows. You can learn more about our 99 cent, 200% money back guarantee, two week membership trial by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. Okay, back to the case. Let's take a look at the analysis by the appellate court in this decision. It's relatively brief. So the defendant appealed his conviction in part on the grounds that the trial court committed reversible error when it allowed the prosecution, prosecution, sorry, prosecution to present evidence of his two prior misdemeanor convictions. That's how you know it's a live show, folks, because we don't edit out the stutters. Um. He objected to the prosecutor presenting evidence of his two prior misdemeanor convictions for carrying a concealed firearm unlawfully, as well as the evidence of his involuntary, less than honorable separation from the Marine Corps. And the appellate court notes that, well, the defense at pretrial had moved in limine, meaning uh, they made a motion to exclude that evidence from the trial to prohibit the prosecution from introducing the involuntary separation and the prior misdemeanor convictions of the defendant. And the trial court agreed to exclude this evidence, but on the condition that the defense not introduce evidence of the defendant's good character based on his Marine Corps service. 
uh, if the defendant did that, then that would open the door to the prosecution to introduce the evidence of the involuntary separation from the Marine Corps and the prior conviction. So everybody knew this going in because this was, as is normally the case, settled and agreed upon pre-trial. Now, as already noted, the defense ended up introducing considerable evidence of the defendant's Marine Corps career in an effort to buttress his apparent character before the jury. And the appellate court also notes that the trial court, um, trial courts generally are given very broad discretion in making these kinds of evidentiary rulings. Uh, and that the evidentiary decisions of a trial court will be reversed only if they're what's called an abuse of discretion by the trial court, meaning that the trial court really had no good reason for making that decision. It exercised its discretion in an arbitrary or capricious or patently observed, absurd manner that results in a miscarriage of justice. But here, the appellate court found that the trial court did not decide to admit the evidence of less than honorable separation of prior convictions in an arbitrary, capricious, or patently absurd manner. To the contrary, the trial court's stated reasons for admitting the bad character evidence fell directly in line with the long-standing allowance for permitting such normally inadmissible evidence to be admitted, to wit that the defense opened the door to the bad character evidence by first introducing purported evidence in support of the defendant's purported good character. To quote the appellate court decision, quote, we conclude that the trial court properly allowed the prosecutors to question the defendant about the reasons for his involuntary separation from the Marine Corps and specifically his two prior misdemeanor convictions. As the trial court explained, the defendant initially opened the door to the admission of that evidence by presenting in his defense case active duty Marine witness Kaiser and his own testimony, the defendant's own testimony, regarding his Marine Corps training. Kaiser, still an active duty Marine, testified regarding Marine Corps training and shooting, and in particular, the defendant's skills as a shooter while he was in the Marine Corps. Kaiser twice referred to the defendant as Staff Sergeant. The trial court reasonably concluded that by so testifying, Kaiser had painted a picture of the defendant as being a quote-unquote good Marine. I'll continue to quote the appellate court decision, quote, the defendant's, testimony, the defendant's testimony also implied that he had been a good Marine. He testified he was a Marine from 1997 to 2009 and extensively described his training as a Marine. The trial court could have reasonably concluded that the testimony of Kaiser and the defendant, which was presented in the main defense case, created a positive image of the defendant as having been a good Marine in general and not just a skilled shooter. To counter that positive image created during the defense case, the prosecutor reasonably questioned the defendant on cross-examination regarding whether he was permitted to wear a Marine uniform or eligible to re-enlist in the Marine Corps. The defendant answered, no, I'm too old now. That incomplete and misleading answer opened the door to the prosecutor's further questions regarding the circumstances of the defendant's separation from the Marine Corps, which resulted in his admission that the separation was not voluntary, close quote. Now, the appellate court also noted other misleading responses by the defendant to questions about his separation from the Marine Corps. The defendant was rather deceptive throughout his testimony. So that was the analysis of the court. And given that analysis, I'm sure it will not come as a surprise to any of you that the outcome of the case was that the Court of Appeal affirmed the defendant's convictions for conspiracy to commit murder and premeditated attempted murder. Now, if you go read the entirety of this decision, which I do encourage you to do, again, it's linked in the text version of today's show. The Court of Appeal did, however, find some errors in the defendant's sentencing, and so his case was remanded for the back to the trial court, sent back to the trial court for the limited purposes of adjusting the sentencing, so it was correct. But the convictions themselves were left in place as determined by the jury. So my own comments of the ca this case are very brief. Sometimes my comments are extensive, but the bottom line, I wanted to share this case with all of you as a model for how normally inadmissible character evidence that the jury would never see, and that could be really harmful to a defense if the jury does see it, can suddenly become admissible if the defense opens the door to such evidence through its own testimony or the testimony of other defense witnesses. Criminal defense is a strategic game, folks. Make sure you have a world-class strategist on your legal team if you want to avoid these kinds of catastrophic failures. 
Okay, folks, a couple other things I want to touch upon before I let everyone go. One is if you like this kind of information and would yourself like a world-class education in self-defense law, a great place to get that is at the Law of Self-Defense Level 1 Live Online class. This is a one-day class that's the equivalent of a semester-long law school course in use of force law. This is our live full-day class taught in a f webinar format. It's taught live by me. It's not a recording, so there's plenty of opportunity for live Q&A. But instead of having to travel someplace, either you having to travel to a classroom or me having to travel across the country, we stream the class directly to your computer, laptop, or tablet using our webinar software. This is the most in-depth education available anywhere on self-defense law, and I include law school in that, folks. Law schools do not teach this stuff at anywhere like this depth. In my three years of law school, I got a few minutes of self-defense law education, and that was it. In this Level 1 Live Online class, self-defense law is taught in plain English, so you need not be concerned about the class being too technical. The class is perfectly appropriate for everybody. And in the class, we answer more than 100 very specific self-defense law questions. I expect most of you don't know the answers to most of those questions. In fact, I expect many of you don't even know most of the right questions, which is a terrible place to be. Now, we have one more of these classes in 2020, folks, on Saturday, October 3rd. After that, it'll be months well into 2021 before you have the opportunity to take another one. In fact, we're probably only doing two of these Level 1 Live Online classes in all of 2021. And when the seats are gone, folks, that's the end of the opportunity. So if you're at all interested in getting an expert knowledge of self-defense law in a single day for only a very modest investment, then I would urge you to point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash live online. Also, obviously, if you want any chance of having your act of self-defense to be anywhere near the legal boundaries, you need to know where those legal boundaries are if you're not going to step over them simply out of ignorance. And being a member of Law of Self-Defense and taking our Level 1 live online class is a great way to learn where those legal boundaries are. That's why we offer those to all of you. But... What if you're subject to, for example, a politically motivated prosecution? What if you did everything right and yet you're still having to go to trial to prove you did it right? Well, then you're going to have to win that legal fight, folks, just like you had to win the physical fight. And the best way to win that legal fight is to bring all the best resources you can to that fight, which brings me to another opportunity for you to think about, and that is our Law of Self-Defense Platinum Protection Program. Our Platinum Protection Program is the only way to guarantee my personal availability to consult on your legal team if you're charged with the use of force event. Most of the time, folks, when we have cases come to the office, because of my other prior commitments, I have to say I'm sorry. No, I can't work on that case unless you're a Platinum Protection Program member, in which case we promise we drop everything immediately to consult on your case. And that immediately is important, folks, because it makes a big difference whether or not you can raise that legal defense of self-defense in a compelling way before the prosecution's invested too much of their own resources into taking you to trial to be willing to kick you loose. You want to get off that track to trial as quickly as you possibly can. Another benefit of the Platinum Protection Program is that you get, you get my legal consult services at no additional cost beyond that of the membership. Normally, my legal consultation costs several thousands of dollars, folks. It's quite costly, but it's free to you if you're a member of the Platinum Protection Program. And finally, if you're already a Law Self-Defense member, the Platinum Protection Program is an upgrade to your current level of membership. So whatever you're currently paying to be a Law Self-Defense member is applied to the cost of the Platinum Protection Program rather than in addition to the cost of that program. So if that's at all of interest, I urge you to point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash platinum. Okay, folks, that's about all I have for everybody today, I believe. Let me pull this back up, get my name back up there. Let's see. There we go. Uh, of course, in closing, I always like to remind all of you that if you carry a gun for personal protection, you're really carrying that gun so that you're hard to kill. Certainly, that's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Well, you also owe it to your folks, uh, yourself folks and your family to make sure that you know the law so that you're hard to convict. 
All right, folks, that's all I have for you today. Until the next time, stay safe. And again, I'm attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Take care.